that uh, that interview with MBS uh, that was a good uh, kickoff to Jeffrey's week, but it wasn't even him just letting this asshole say Iran wants to conquer the world with absolutely no pushback whatsoever. Uh, not even close to being the most embarrassing thing that happened to Jeffrey Goldberg this week. The most embarrassing thing for sure was the hilarious implosion of the Kevin D. Williamson saga and his unceremonious canning from the Atlantic almost as soon as that fucking <laughs> minge the merciless, as we've been calling it. <laughs> That's not a hired. fucking mispronunciation, people. We're, We're saying that his mouth, it looks like a hairy pussy. It's a very smart joke. You need a high IQ to understand it. Jesus Christ. So Jeffrey's role in the Kevin D. Williamson saga is underrated because people have been largely focusing on uh, Cold Stone Steve Austin, the fat yes. people's eyebrow, and the, 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 and El, the El Nino of big boy season. <laughs> yeah, they've been focusing on Kevin and, and... And also the intolerant libs. And the intolerant libs and whether Kevin's a martyr or not. But really, Absolutely. The, the, real, the real player here is Jeffrey Goldberg, who made the decision to hire him to you know, be a contributor to their new ideas section. Whoa. And when the controversy start, first started coming out, particularly Kevin's comments regarding that you know, women who have gotten abortions deserve to be hung, hanged, sorry, um, Jeffrey's response to that was, in effect, I don't agree with Kevin, but it's a tweet. Come on, people. It's a tweet. We shouldn't judge people based on, like, you know, a throwaway comment or whatever. This was the same argument that Brett Stevens made. And Jeffrey was implying that, you know, again, liberals are being too precious. It's important to hear other ideas, even if you disagree with them. And basically said that, that Kevin was talented, but he was just trolling. He was taking a, a needlessly provocative position in a, an attempt to sort of own the, stir, libs. own the libs and stir intellectual debate. Well, mostly own the libs. Yeah. Then it came out that Kevin Williamson had indeed said the exact same thing on a podcast. That was a bridge too far. And in Jeffrey's response to it, he seemed to say that, you know, a tweet is one thing, but him saying the exact same thing in an audio version is too much. And he said here, um, he did not want to judge people for their worst tweets or assertions in isolation. But then on Thursday, Mr. Goldberg wrote in a memo to his staff that he had come to see the writer's remarks on Twitter as something more than merely trollish. The editor cited a podcast episode from the same month in which Mr. Williamson elaborated on his anti-abortion views. The tweet was not merely an impulsive, decontextualized, heat-of-the-moment post, as Kevin had explained it, Mr. Goldberg wrote. Furthermore, the the language used in the podcast was callous and violent. What heat? This runs contrary to the Atlantic's tradition of respectful, well-reasoned debate and to the values of our work. Just because he was sweating when he tweeted it doesn't mean there was any heat in the moment. <laughs> a, a quick aside here. Treat of the moment. I'm, I'm reading from the New York Times coverage of this, but it has this little nugget here that is just too good to pass up. The podcast in question was a national review show called Mad Dogs and Englishmen, hosted by Mr. Williamson and Charles C.W. Cook. Oh, God. The title of that podcast is more offensive to me than Kevin comments on Capital Punishment for Women. Oh, my God. That that would be the name of a morning zoo crew show in the Raj if it still existed. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, that's what. Oh, God. That's what Opie and Anthony would be called in Victorian England. Yeah. <laughs> it's just very upsetting. Oh, God. What's hilarious about this, there's pro- there's There's probably like a whiskey review corner or something. Oh, God. We have no, to no, gin. This. It's English. Oh, yeah, it's gin. gin. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they drink gin. They, they're probably smoking really shitty cigars while doing it. Oh, oh. 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 Giving myself lupus just thinking about Yeah, if you podcast. actually listen to that podcast, you find a more controversial opinion from Kevin. He walks back hanging the women and he says uh, they should actually tie them to train tracks. <laughs> More in line with his, uh, his, his preferred method, method of doing things. Um, but what's funny about this is it reveals Jeffrey Goldberg is an absolute fraud. Because his whole, whole thing in, in trying to hire Kevin in the first place is like, he's provocative. You know, we're a liberal magazine, but we're not afraid to challenge ourselves and have ideas from outside the bubble. And then when confronted with Kevin's actual beliefs... His defense immediately is he's just joking. Yeah. He doesn't really believe that. Yeah. It, and then he has to walk it back when it becomes obvious that, yes, indeed, he does believe it. So yeah, it's a lot of f- fucking respect that someone like Jeffrey Goldberg has for conservative ideas. Well, it's, that's just it. It's that 
the thing that needs to be gotten away with completely is the idea that there are any ideas being uh, discussed or or exchanged in any of these things on the New York Times op ed page at the Atlantic. There, there are no ideas being transmitted. No one is learning anything. You are, you are intentionally riling up an audience for response. It is just the clickbait model of online publication brought to the mainstream. That's all that it is. It is totally vacuous, that's, and that's all that it exists to do. That's true, but like the other important thing, about, particularly about what the, the Kevin saga uh, tells us about the current state of the liberal media, is that they are at a crisis point in their... A crisis point in the media. <laughs> in their sort of self-image and conception, because The Atlantic is a magazine owned by David Bradley, who is a committed ideological neoconservative, but sold and pitched to an audience entirely of cosmopolitan liberals. The New York Times has sort of a similar dynamic yeah. going with it. The thing is, what they are selling to their readership is the fantasy that they are smarter and more open-minded than the baying, idiotic hordes that, that are beneath them, the Trump voters. This is because, why... And that's the thing. This that, is why it is most, the most important qualification for Kevin Williamson or Brett Stevens or any of these guys is that they're against Trump. Yep. Here's the problem. These people have their only influence now is with liberals. Mm -hmm. The conservative movement and actual body politic has completely passed them by. There is no such thing as a, you know, anti-Trump conservative now. Not on the, the ground. No. Not on the actual, not with any actual influence over government yeah. or policy. Every single anti-Trump conservative has a column somewhere. Exactly. There are probably, um, like, this is not an exaggeration. I'm like, this is my best guess. I would say there are probably, I would say, between 500 and 1,000 people in America who think Trump is bad, but the Iraq war was good. <laughs> so, like, all these people have columns, and their only influence is with their, a liberal readership. However, the, the one line, the, the abortion technically still is the red line, because libs can, you know, they can, they're happy to entertain, you know, thoughts of foreign intervention or cutting Social Security or free markets. However, things like wanting to hang women for getting an abortion or just the outright criminalization or demonization of abortion is still something that most people who read The Atlantic rightly want nothing to do with. Not even nothing to do with, but like they don't think rightly that it's an idea or a thought that should be given serious treatment well, the only in a magazine that, makes, that the they're only thing paying that makes for. It's that they're pro-choice. Exactly. So they're going to their core in a way that all this other contrarianism doesn't. Exactly. And here's here's the thing though is bec like there's no more need for people like Kevin D Williamson outside of these sort of, you know, hot houses like the National Review or things that are pitched solely to ideological conservatives of a certain variety. Right. Mm -hmm. What the fuck use does it have for the New York Times or the Atlantic to hire these people just to goose their liberal readership into considering whether maybe we should criminalize abortion? These people have no poli they have no influence over policy or the conservative movement anymore. So what does their value add to a place like the Atlantic or the New York Times? Their yeah, it's to flatter the audience. It's to make them feel like, yes, that they're more broad-minded than either the, the hooting swine who voted for Trump or the Antifa hordes of, of illiberal leftists. And, but the thing is, they still have lines. You know? they, still have, they still have things that are unacceptable. There have to be, because if you don't have anything, then what the fuck are you? You have to have some sort of container and so there has to be a line, a thing that's beyond the pale. And yeah, he fucking went across it. Be in his zeal for triggering libs. Congratulations, you triggered the libs. And they don't want to hire you now because you did it. You were too good at triggering the libs. The, so this, go back to the National Review. This dynamic about conservative intellectuals, I just want to read a little bit from a post by Henry Farrell from this week uh, that I think really does a very good job summarizing this. Uh, it's titled... Who has any use for conservative intellectuals? And I just want to read from a little bit. He says, The conservative movement perceived the need for intellectuals, both to hold their own fractious coalition together through fusionism and the like, and to justify their goals to liberals who dominated the space of serious policy discussions and could possibly stop them. Liberal policy types, for their part, needed to understand that what was happening among conservatives and perhaps, host, perhaps hopes to influence it a little. The result was that the conservative intellectuals were in a highly advantageous structural position, serving as the primary link between two different spheres, which didn't otherwise 
come much into contact. As Network Sociology 101 will tell you, this allowed them a fair amount of arbitrage and enough slack that people like Jonah Goldberg were treated as serious thinkers. Oh, God, remember that. The problem is, and now he's saying, like, uh, the never-Trump people... Uh, remember, they, they defected en masse, thinking that it was a fairly cheap gesture of independence. We all remember the never Trump issue of the National yeah, Review. Yeah, they, uh, they were born defective, and they never stopped. Not only did this damage these intellectuals' personal ties with the new administration and the conservative movement, but it opened up the way for, con- for a conservatism that basically didn't give a fuck about policy ideas and the need to seem serious anymore. The result is that conservative intellectuals don't have all that much influence over conservatism anymore. The problem is that without such influence over conservatives, these intellectuals' capital with liberals and the left is rapidly diminishing too. If conservative intellectuals don't have much of an audience without conservatism itself, why should people on the opposite side listen to them anymore their actual ideas are mostly not that strong some of them are good writers but good writing only goes so far the only plausible case for paying attention to conservative intellectuals qua conservative intellectuals is that perhaps the pendulum will swing back after trump and the old regime will be restored that might happen but you wouldn't want to be betting serious money on it and i think that gets it exactly right about this sort of panic that assholes like everyone who has invested so heavily in the idea that it's really important to engage with the thoughts of the other side are at a point now where they really can't continue this charade for much longer because conservatives never ever pretend to take seriously the ideas of of liberals or the left and if you're gonna nor would they ever ever even conceive of hiring like a left-wing voice to write for the national review or weekly standard yeah and if you're gonna pretend to care about the other side's ideas then the other side loves trump get some actual pro-trump fucking conservatives then get bill mitchell those on are the one pe- those are the, there's there's zero pro-trump columnists at a, at a at a major mainstream like liberal audience Mm-hmm. So you only have these these ideological eunuchs who have no influence and speak for no one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're really interested in representing the country, get one of those freakish positive Trump reply guys. Get one of those children. Jacob who can, Wool. Yeah, get yeah. one of those kids who can't seem to wash their face or wear shirts that fit and just reply like, MLK would have loved Trump and stuff like that. Just put them in there. No one cares. No one. No, yeah. It's going to represent way more people than, yeah, Snidely Whiplash or Homer Simpson in the landlord costume. <laughs> <laughs> any of the other people you're hiring. But I think it should be noted that both David Bradley and Jeffrey Goldberg are ideologically committed neoconservatives, right? Which means they're happy to fucking deal with social liberals and they don't mind it at all. Yeah, they don't care about it. But they don't shit. give a shit about it. That, po- the po- that politics doesn't interest them. In fact, all domestic politics are entirely negotiable to them. It could shake out any way they'd be fine As with Richard it. As Richard Nixon uh, referred to it, it's building outhouses in Peoria. Who yeah. gives a shit? That's domestic politics to them. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg has even said as much during, the t- I think, the 2008 election. He said, the only question in this election is what the president will do to prevent al-Qaeda from getting nuclear weapons. Oh. Everything else, everything else, you know, taxes, education, infrastructure, that's all just window dressing. It's the only question worth addressing. And then, of course, unspoken in that is how to confront Iran militarily as well. Well, I, I object to one point, though, when you say that Kevin Williamson was just triggering the libs with his outrageous abortion remarks about his day of the rope fantasy for women. Uh, that's not the case. This is a very personal matter to him. Oh, yes. Oh, Let's this. talk about so this. So the uh, friend of the show, the baseball crank, has been one of <laughs> Kevin Williamson's <laughs> most voice. indefatigable defenders recently and correctly points out that, you know, conservatives have been hearing for years uh, from the left that, uh, you know, you men should not have a say over women's body. This is a women's issue. That's what abortion is. Uh Apparently, that's not the case. This is, an, this is a major issue that impacts Kevin. Reading from the crank. Do the voice. Kevin feels... Do espe- the voice. Kevin feels especially strongly... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, he's not sick. Uh, he can do the voice. I'm a little sick, but... <sighs> <clears throat> this is precisely why this is asymmetrical. Kevin feels especially strongly about this issue because he's the sort of person who could maybe would have been aborted after 1973 they extend no similar empathy to how this affects him personally 
And then links to uh, Kevin Williamson's big article about the issue, which I'll read from right now in the National Review. This is from 2015, uh, about that 20-week abortion bill. A note to House Republicans. This is the 42nd anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I never need reminding of which anniversary it is. It's always the same as my age. I was one of those who entered the world through a pregnancy of the sort we call unplanned. Though I do not object to being, quote, the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. I was born about three months, call it a trimester, before Roe. In my case, the result was an adoption. Mine wasn't, as it turns out, the sort of success story you'd put in a brochure. My adoptive parents were divorced only a few years later, and there was subsequently a great deal of unpleasantness in my home upon which I do not intend to dwell. Some had happier families, some far worse. Eventually, I discovered that I had certain talents, which <laughs> friends encouraged and teachers helped me develop. I had to be... <laughs> I could float upside down. <laughs> was invisible in mirrors. I had the uniquely American experience of playing high school football in West Texas for what was the longest uh, losing Friday, fr- Friday Daywalker lights. <laughs> More like Friday Night Frights. <laughs> <laughs> Learned a trade at the mighty, mighty Daily Texan at the University of Texas and then moved to India to apply it. I was editor-in-chief of a small newspaper before I was 30 and started a daily newspaper in Philadelphia a few years later. I failed at that, but it was tremendously fun. And on our better days, we put out a more interesting broadsheet than the Inquirer. I have published a few books, had a few rejected, walked in the foothills of the Himalayas and driven a convertible through the Alps, gone into bar fights, play, played box prelude as part of a classical guitar duet. I would. I work at the only magazine I've ever really wanted to work at, and Bill Buckley once asked me for a word he was unable to call up at the moment. There have been a few rough stretches and some that have been nearly perfect. None of it was optional. I've been po- a puppet, it- a pauper, a poet, a puller, a poet, a king. Is it possible to give somebody like a 500th trimester mercy abortion <laughs> well, that's after not- that? That is the most depressing thing I have ever heard. Okay. Oh, yeah, you want to abort me? Guess what? Bill Buckley placed his lizard hand on my shoulder. I got, I got my book rejected. I've been in bar fights. I've had a little drink called tequila. I've driven a car. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I could go to the movies by myself like that. I climb the gentle foothills of the Himalayas. Yeah, like if you get off of the airport, off the airplane in Kathmandu, congratulations, you're in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, I've gotten into a hot tub without my T-shirt on. Uh, I think if you're, if you're a pro life position is you need to ban abortion or else Kevin Williamson will be aborted, you're fucking up. Because he's not really a sterling example of the people that you want to have have around. This this is great. I love the he takes it personally because he could have been aborted. Because it's like the guys who are like, yeah... Dude, don't insult the military. I actually almost signed up for the National Guard after 9-11. <laughs> that could have been me. This, yeah, the, whoa, whoa, whoa. They act like he fucking crawled out of a dumpster behind a Planned no, listen, Parenthood listen after th- they like scraped him out. Listen to this. Here's the climax of the article. People like me, we unplanned, the millions of us, now live the first part of our lives outside the protection of the laws of these United States. Our, he's comparing himself to Dred Scott. Our lives and very often our deaths are instruments of the convenience of others. That was different in my case by a matter of a few months. It is impossible for me to know whether the woman who gave birth to me would have chosen abortion if there had been a more readily available alternative in 1972. I would not bet my life, neither the good nor bad parts of it, on her not choosing it. Well, Virgil, as you rightly pointed out, um, we're in a a weird place now where um, genetic screening is able to tell earlier and earlier if your fetus will become a National Review columnist. And we're in danger of losing them, all of them. Ma'am, your child will be perfectly round. Uh, <laughs> two, two things. Ma'am, ma'am two things. Your, your child is already trapped in the uterine elevator. Ma'am, your, your child will, <laughs> will never be able to ride the New York City subway. <laughs> two things. One, he could have been aborted before Roe. Yeah. The idea that there were no abortions before Roe, fuck, you're a fucking idiot if you think that. People were having plenty of abortions. They were just unsafe and, and often dangerous for the mothers. They would and, actually throw the baseball crank at them. <laughs> That's why he's so against it. Uh, and two, anybody could have been a fucking abortion. This idea that only uh, only unwanted pregnant or, or only uh, 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 poor women or only people who, who, who go on to adopt their kids might have been. Plenty of people... Abort, plenty of women have abortions who are married, who have children already. It's a choice that ton, 30% of my some estimations of American women have made. Any of us could have been fucking aborted. The idea that he's some fucking special case, wait, wait, wait. Are that you he's saying, some escapee from Logan's run, are fuck you, off. Are you saying 
we're also in the protected class of we possible are. abortion. Guys, victims. guys, oh we, my god. And we are everyone in this room. We're all survivors. Any women listening right now, I just found out I survived a near death experience <laughs> as a child. I don't want to feel Please alone. protect me. All I right. want I, I actually help send nudes. I actually would like to talk about this from a slightly personal perspective. Uh, you, Matt, you mentioned, uh, does the pro-life movement no favors to have Kevin Williamson as their, either as their spokesperson saying the thing that they all actually must never, ever actually say, which is that if abortion becomes criminalized, women will be punished with have the to. force of Makes law, sense. if not executed, um, de- certainly put in jail, as is the case in every other country where abortion yes. is illegal. Like El Salvador, there are women in jail for having miscarriages yes. and shit like that. Of course, well, in in Indiana too. Yeah, we've done that yeah. here. It's just not on the law. It's just not on the laws um, in that way. But we do do that. Here. But also the idea that like, uh, had I been aborted. I, Kevin Williamson, wouldn't be here sharing my brilliant thoughts and writing with you is perhaps not the best uh, sales pitch either. Kevin makes the point, and his defenders have done this, as as Virgil pointed out. Uh, they're, they're getting into this big debate. That, like this is personal for Kevin because you know he missed the cutoff by about a week. You know now he's out for justice. <laughs> he's out for justice. Okay. The pro-life movement would do better to not use Kevin as their spokesperson, but uh, me. Because I oh. actually come from the exact same yeah. circumstances as Kevin. Um, I was born to a teen mom and adopted very shortly thereafter. No, I don't. I'm not saying I would prefer to be dead. I now that I have my life, I'm glad I have it. I very well could have been aborted. But however, wait, wait a minute, I'm confused though. You were born after Roe, though. Yeah, but that's not that. He's assuming he would have been aborted. Oh, no, no, no. Will Lu- so why Will, weren't Will, you aborted? Will loopered himself. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a time paradox yeah. on my own father. Yeah. And I was, I was actually Will's biological parents. I also loopered. I went back, and I was like, keep going. You're doing great, dog. Conceive this kid. I need this. Well, well hang on. If Matt's right and anyone is, is, is a survivor of abortion, then I think we should go bigger. I think it should be Tom Hanks. And they should put these big billboards up that say, hey, America, Tom Hanks could have been aborted. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you like all his movies? Now imagine they don't exist. But, I mean, like, for me, like, personally, like, I, I acknowledge, like, I, I believe abortion should be legal. I don't think it's a, I think it's a moral decision that uh, every uh, woman has to decide for themselves. I don't know where I would come down personally on the issue if I was ever involved in a pregnancy. Uh, however. If you ever have sex, we'll, someday we'll find we'll out. We'll find out, hopefully. Knock on wood. However, the uh, thing we've is, we've been trying for years, you and me. <laughs> the thing is, the point is, it, it, it the, the line between existing and not existing from the moment of conception is something that could be said about everyone. And I'm sorry, like if my life just blinked out of existence at the hand of a doctor or a unwanted pregnancy, well then I can't say that not existing really bothered me before then. I actually, I'm with Kierkegaard, or no, I'm sorry, I'm with Schopenhauer. I think it would have been better if none of us had ever been born. <laughs> Well, like I said, now that I'm here, it's pretty good. And um, for now, for now. But um, again, this the, this cheap maudlin uh, sympathy act that Kevin D. Williamson is going for by being like, I could have been aborted is the cheapest fraud imaginable. And people are calling him brave for saying it. And it's just like, yeah, I love the idea that now he's wreaking his vengeance on the women of the world. <laughs> but now his, another line that his defenders have taken up in this his grotesque idea, that, as Virgil said, his day of the rope fantasies about all the harlots out there that would have killed him if he had the chance. His defenders are saying, oh, well, you didn't listen to the full interview. He goes on to say, I'm sort of squishy on capital punishment as an idea. He sort of waffles on whether he's even in favor of oh, the death penalty. Oh, he loves waffles. <laughs> <laughs> he waffles and he pancakes and he omelets and he donuts. He, he, says, he says he's not sure if he favors capital punishment, but if we do have capital punishment, it should be hangings and, execu- and like beheadings rather than lethal injection. To make it because, as spectacular as possible. Yeah, he wants to see the old style capital punishment and then he said he also said that he doesn't believe laws can uh, apply be applied so, retroactively so his defenders are saying oh he doesn't really want to kill a quarter of all I, american I, so, adult women he just thinks they deserve to die yeah, exactly. so all of that is totally incoherent but it just made me realize wait a minute all of kevin's politics emanate from him hating his birth mother and fantasizing about murdering but his she didn't birth have mom. an abortion doesn't matter to him no no kevin hates his adopted parents 
that that is definitely true. If you read his articles about his relatives in Lubbock and how uh, the utter uh, hatred and contempt. No, he, he has yeah, for he them. definitely hates. He them. really he hates. I think he hates his birth mother and adopted mother and all moms everywhere. Yeah. So he hates can, all parents. He's yeah. he's like the the conservative memes about David Hogg and Antifa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he he formed his politics when he saw the Beastie Boy videos where they throw a pie in the mom's face for telling them not to party, <laughs> except it's a gun. Uh, I, this entire Williamson thing, though, it is a great. It's sort of uh, you know that museum exhibit where they s- give you slices of the human body and you get to right. see how every little part works. This is this is kind of that for the conservative victimhood complex because their whole thing, their whole thing. For pretty much my entire life has been like, oh, your liberals are a bunch of pussies. You just come up with these new identities you can go into, slot yourselves into to make yourselves a protected class. But the moment it turns around on them, it's like, no, I'm actually an abortion survivor. <laughs> and you, they're, you know, they, they who spent years and years and years trying to get everyone fired, the fucking Dixie Chicks. Everyone. How about just Kaepernick of a more recent vintage? fucking Colin Kaepernick? The second it can be turned on them, they're like, you should never go after someone's job. And I actually like I'm more sympathetic than most people to the like I'm more negative towards getting anyone fired than I think anyone in this Williamson debate. But from those fucking people who did that more than anyone who pretty much got the ball rolling on all, all that shit. Whenever it can be possibly turned around on them, suddenly they have every type of identifiable uh, identity quantifier, and they are just so opposed to going after anyone's livelihood. And the and in the end, who gives a shit? Kevin D. Williamson is going to be invited back into the castle. Yeah, well, and he's blah, a blah, fucking blah, li- he's a literal landlord. Yeah, well, and also. I mean, sorry, Jeffrey Goldberg. Yeah, you fired him. But once you invite a Kevin Williamson into your magazine, he can come and go as he pleases. <laughs> you better get some fucking garlic, buddy. Uh, one kind of uh, parenthetical thing, though, uh, that I would like someone to explain. Someone of the of the Connor Frycor or Brett Stevens <laughs> of people. By the way, is, uh, Molly Hemingway brought this up. Is Connor Frycor? Is he going to resign from the Atlantic? He really should. As, as, is he going to resign? Pr- no, Connor resign. Connor as, resign. Yeah, be principal, buddy. But. There, I need them to explain to me what what are tweets. Are tweets an example of a budding hive mind of illiberal neo Stalinists enforcing political correctness on people, or a place to blow off steam that doesn't mean anything? Which is it? Because you, the people who are saying they're just tweets, like Brett Stevens wrote, they're just tweets. The guy has written approximately five million columns about the awful tweets of the left that prove that we're headed towards gulags. So what the fuck is a tweet? Is it only a tweet when it's one of your fellow media class ghouls? And when it's the hoi polloi, it's, it's pitchforks? Maybe that's, I guess that's the explanation. I think certainly similar to that. Uh, Alex Perrine made a good point about this a while ago, and he brought it up again with regards to the Williamson thing. Just like, underscore, I sort of said it earlier, but people in the liberal media class are very invested in this idea that they are charitable and open-minded to their colleagues on the right. So much so that they invest this idea, they invest so much in this idea that it's just intellectual debate, it's just tweets, they don't actually believe the things that they claim to. Nobody could possibly yeah. believe that you could execute a woman for making yeah. a painful but personal medical decision. Yeah. No, sorry, there are plenty of people who really do fucking believe that. And what's more, this whole, like, abortion, pro-choice, pro-life debate on the question of punishment is actually a very good one that I think we should be having and that I think the pro-choice side needs to be asked quite point blankly what punishment... Pro-life. Pro-life. Sorry, the pro-life side. Ooh, you. <laughs> it's, it's easy to confuse these things. It's true. It's, well, they're, it's both. The people who want abortion criminalized yeah. should be asked and they should be made to answer, quite frankly... What sort of criminal punishments will be in store for not just the doctors or the women who procure them? Let's say you drive a woman to a clinic. Mm. Let's say you give her money to get an abortion. Uh, yeah. Are you an accomplice to murder as well? There's a whole litany of uh, crimes and accomplices that can be opened up now. And I think they should be forced to delineate exactly what kind of punishment is in store for these people. Should Roe v. Wade be overturned and they... Uh, get an abortion in a state where it becomes illegal. Because it really does expose a fundamental problem for the anti-choice people 
that has been kept at bay just because it's not it doesn't come up because yeah. we're all it's all in the context of of Roe versus Wade. The, the 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 implications, like the actual legal implications, are sort of pushed away because it's it's still theoretical. But the because abortion is supposed to hinge on this question of whether a fetus is a person. And it is something that is metaphysically impossible to know. All you do is you have intuitions one way or the other, and those sort of shape your politics from it. But to people, most people, intuitively, if you told them who has more rights, a human woman who like you could talk to and who has a name and a personality and memories and, and can speak words and and has like a, 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 t- a tv or whatever might be a real gamer girl exactly uh, uh has a favorite book you know uh and a dime-sized collection of cells people will intuitively say the the woman and that that understanding is i think what undergirds the sort of ambient pro-choice belief that people have but it's all kind of soft because there's no real consequences to it it's all just sort of eh, i guess but when you put it in the terms of okay should a woman who gets an abortion be killed or thrown in jail for years the incongruity between the life being protected and the life being either ended or basically destroyed by prison is so vast that people are able to make that, oh, okay, now I understand. I'm pro-choice. It should also be noted that even in a pro-row uh, American society, and for you know, much of human history, even religious institutions like the Catholic Church, for instance, regarded um, and terminating a pregnancy before what was known as the quickening as to be not abortion. Before they've seen Highlander 3. Oh, well, yeah, no, yeah. no. Uh, the quickening yeah. meaning like when you could feel a kick. It was yeah. called like, you know, returning to menses, I mean, basically. One of the most covertly evil associations ever in America, the AMA, we can thank them for a lot of our current abortion debate framing. And but they have to do with it. They, so they sort of push the line as terminating a pregnancy is sort of unacceptable. Or like that it's ending a human life, yeah, like yeah. An, an equivalent to killing a baby. Yeah. Like infanticide. AMA rocks, dude. Yeah, wonder why we don't. don't. Wonder why we don't. Why our healthcare system is sort of like a cruel, practical joke, a Rude Goldberg device, <laughs> or why we frame abortion as like you were trying to kill Kevin D. Williamson. Thank you to the AMA. So also starting the myth that you anyone just can't become a doctor. We could do it. Um, I think we're we're almost out of time here, but before we go, I wanted to bring up these two quotes you asked me to source from oh, yeah. Goldberg. Yeah, yeah so this is a little fun. I just want, I just want fun one fun closing fun. thought oh, on sure, Williamson yeah. before we go back into the uh, the Jeffrey Goldberg story. I just think what all of this proves is whether it's like the New York Times, or the Atlantic, or all these supposedly liberal institutions who want to challenge their liberal readership and open their ideas to critiques from outside their comfortable bubble. Forget this bullshit on the right. Write them off completely. If you really want to challenge people who are liberals, challenge them from the left. That would be useful. In a civilized liberal society, the debate should be between the liberals and the current Democratic Party and those on their left. Everyone to the right of that, they they don't have ideas. They have cruelty and corruption. That's what they offer. Look who's president. Look at the movement as it actually exists. Not this like fantasy uh, parlor game that you have in your head. Write them off completely. You're not closing yourself off to like being open-minded by writing them off. It's called exercising judgment and just a bare level of morality. Yeah, I, I, th- I want the pages of The Atlantic to be a, 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 a sparkling debate about whether the labor aristocrats of the core capitalist countries <laughs> need to be re-educated where they live or spread out, forcibly spread out throughout the rest of the world. That's the fucking debate that's worth having. That would certainly make their readers uncomfortable. Yes. That's what they're looking Way to do. Way more than fucking Brett Stevens farting out another column about college students. Seriously, though, if you want interesting people in there who actually have an audience, because I guarantee you no one is clicking on these other fucking articles, get uh, Brianna Gray, Alex Press, Shuja Hater, Ryan Cooper. Ryan there Cooper. are so many people you could hire that would write interesting things that people would actually read that would prompt the beloved parlor debate you love so much. Uh, Matt Brunig is excellent at trolling the libs. Oh, he God. loves to oh, own my the libs. God. He yes. loves to own the libs. Let's get him on there. 
You know, but put, again, you, you don't fucking put Jason Uhuru in there. <laughs> no, seriously. I want really, Maoist, I'm not kidding. I demand you want Maoist, someone interesting in there. I want Maoist third worldism to be something that these guys have to grapple with instead of something they've literally never heard of. None of these people actually believe that, like, the institutions that they preside over should cater to every conceivable view. No. So just quit lying to yourself and keep the right in their own little silos where they belong, their own little funny farms talking to themselves. You don't need to engage with them. They're not, they're, they're, they're not intellectuals. They're not, good, they're not serious thinkers. They're not serious writers. Like I said, they represent cruelty and corruption, and that's it. I mean, and Ooh. the thing, talking about Williamson, people might have, this might have cost him his job, but if you want to talk about his ideas, hanging women who've had abortions is literally the only idea he's ever had that's, that's distinct... And, and a Willi- like Williamsonian as opposed to just bog standard conservative misanthropy, which is the rest of his fucking output. You, you want to pick somebody who would actually really piss people off, but he wouldn't do it just advocating sort of a woman genocide. Actually interesting and actually right. Put Adolf Reed in there. Ooh, he hell yeah. Piss- oh, oh, my, my God. He would, tree would piss the libs off. Oh, oh my God. God. For and Adolf, sure. Reed, Adolf Reed can actually fucking write. But again, it gets back to the essential dynamic at play here, which is that for committed neoconservatives like Goldberg and Bradley and the people who run the Times opinion page, what is really out of bounds is the left. They don't th- What they think out of bounds is hanging bankers who are responsible for the financial <laughs> disaster or for the assholes who started the Iraq war. That to them is out of bounds. Yeah. And that is why that they will always continue to play footsie with these um, oafish, balded, <laughs> just tubs of suet, like <laughs> Kevin D. Williamson, or as I call, him, how about call him, how about H. L. Merkin? <laughs> <laughs>